Good morning, Loft. Um, I am so honored uh, to be able to address you guys this morning. And uh, uh, Sam, thanks for allowing me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, my family and I, uh, we've been uh, coming to Loft now for a little bit over a year regularly. And, uh, you know, one of the things that drew us here was the uh, diversity among you guys and the diversity that we get to experience uh, in fellowshipping and worshiping with everyone here. And, and we just love that. And that's uh, one of the reasons that drew us to Loft here. And though we may be diverse, uh, there is something that I think that we all have in common. And so I guess uh, that commonality, of course, is that we, are, uh, that we love Jesus. But beyond that, there's also another thing. We all live in Texas, right? Yeah, so that's one thing we have in common. So I guess we're all, we, we, you, we could call all of us Texans in some way or another. So we're all Texans in some way or another. And some of you have been here for a little while. Some of you guys here have been here for a long time. And maybe even some of you are native Texans. Anyone native Texan here? A few, okay, a few of us. Well, I'm not a native Texan, uh, but I've, I was, I've been here since I was two years old. So as far as my memory can serve, uh, I've ever, always been in Texas. So I guess that's pretty close to being a uh, native Texan. But you know, as Texans, we have some uh, pretty interesting, sometimes explicit, uh, sayings here in Texas. You know, there's a certain language that we have in Texas here. And um, just out of curiosity, I'm going to say a few of them. And just by a raise of your hands, let me know if you've heard them before or if you uh, know what they mean. Um, y'all ready? Okay. That wasn't one of them. Not y'all. <laughs> um, so raise your hands if you've heard or know uh, of this one. Uh, what does it mean when a Texan says, I'm, or, or have you heard that when a Texan says, I'm fixing to? Or is it? Yeah, most of y'all. Okay. Well, we, we know what it means. That one's pretty easy. Uh, I'm fixing to means I'm about to do it, or I'm preparing to do it, uh, or I'm going to do it soon enough. Don't worry about it, or something like that, right? Okay, how about this one? This one may be a little bit tougher, but still not that hard. Amo. Amo. Anyone? Oh, we got one. As in A H M O, Amo. It means I'm about to take you down. As in Amo, kick your butt. That's what Amo is. In fact, this saying has gained so much popularity in the part of uh, Texas we live in, up in Wiley. It's actually become the official motto, and I mean official, not unofficial. The official, official motto of Wiley High School football. If you're up in the Wiley area, you'll see the words A A H M O on all all over the place. You'll see them on uh, bumper stickers, on sweatshirts, on t-shirts, and it says AMO. That's their official uh, motto for, for Wiley High School football. Um, okay, here, here, how about this one? <clears throat> Ate my first rodeo. Anyone heard that? Yeah. Yeah, a few of you, not as many, but ain't my first rodeo. This ain't my first rodeo. It means I've done that before. It means I have experience with that. I've been there. I've done that before. I mean, how about this one? This is a good one. Pastor Sam, I like this one. Um, how about them boys? Yeah? Oh, oh, just a few of you. All right. Well, how about them boys is uh, referring to who? The Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys. So it's a Texan saying for sure, especially up here in the Dallas area. Well, the meaning of this one isn't so hard to figure out. How about them boys? But what is unique about it is the way that it's used, the way that we use, how about them boys? It's often used when, there, when a conversation kind of gets dull or kind of uh, goes awkward uh, or kind of there's a lull in conversation. What can we as Texans always say to get out of that situation? How about them boys? And then we can always change the topic. So that's sort of unique to, uh, I think, Texas here. Okay. Um, one more, well, two more. Fell off the turnip truck. Anyone heard that? No one. Wow. Oh, well, there's one, two, okay, a few of us. So fell off the turnip truck. It's used to refer to someone that ain't too bright, that isn't too 
and smart. In other words, a turnip is such a dull vegetable uh, that that person is like a turnip, but he's even dumb, dumber than the turnip because he fell off the truck. So, fell off the turnip truck. Um, and it's not a, it's for a not very well educated, not sophisticated, it's somewhat dumb witted uh, person. So, he just fell off the tr turnip truck. It's equivalent to Sam uh, when he's, uh, I'm not saying he, <laughs> that's not what I meant. What I meant, it's, uh, what I was about to say, it's equivalent to what Sam likes to say. Uh, one fry short of a uh, Happy Meal. I've heard him say that several times. So, Sort of like that. Okay, last one. That's the last one. Ain't that something else? Or maybe ain't he or ain't she something else? Anyone heard that? Yeah, most of y'all. Good, good, good. And ain't she something else? Or ain't he something else? It implies a uniqueness. It implies, uh, it, it implies uh, something about someone or something uh, that may be very astonishing, or something that you come into uh, and you can't really uh, describe it in words. We use it uh, when we lack words to describe something. Maybe something so wonderful and something so awe-inspiring that words just wouldn't do it justice. Ain't that something? Ain't that something else? You know, Texans don't usually lack <clears throat> words to describe something. You know, we have all sorts of unique ways to come up with ways of uh, describing things. And, uh, but for a Texan to say, ain't that something else, means that you really have to put, give, put that person in awe. You really might have shocked that person in some way, to such a degree that they are at a loss for words. You know, there was even a number one country hit song in the mid-90s, <clears throat> uh, not in the 90s, in the mid-80s, maybe before a lot of years' times. Uh, but the superstar country singer, Conway Twitty, who's passed away, is known as the uh, living legend of country music when he was living. Uh, the title of his song was Ain't She Something Else? And it was a number one country hit. Maybe some of y'all have heard it. Um, but part of the lyrics of that song proclaim, when she loves me, when she loves me, ain't she something else? I'm not going to sing it. I'm not much of a country singer, but... Uh, in the song, he's saying that the love of this woman, it feels so wonderful. It feels so great that it's indescribable. You know, it's something else. It, it's really, it makes him feel in such a way that he can't even put it into words. And that brings me to today's topic. <clears throat> it's about something uh, that uh, we don't quite get that often. It's something that is uh, kind of difficult to put into words. It's something that is actually quite foreign to us. It's something that we think we might be familiar with, but maybe we don't know as much as we think about it. It's something that's alien to us because it doesn't originate in us. And it's really something else. And my topic for today is holiness. And in so many ways, the entire narrative of the Bible, you know, from the very early beginnings, all the way from, you know, the start of the Bible, all the way through, through Revelation. It revolves around the concept of holiness. And we see it, um, you know, like I said, from the beginning all the way through, through, through Revelation. For most people, the idea of the, holy, uh, of, of the holy is connected to just being a morally good person. And most of us think that if you're holy, that we're referring to somebody that's very morally good. And so God is holy because he is morally perfect. And that is true. And that is part of it. <clears throat> but in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even much bigger. It's even much brighter. It's much, much more rich than just that. You know, what it's really describing is how God, how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one the only being, the only being with that power to make a world full of such beauty and life that we see all around us. And so God, as the creator, it makes him utterly unique. It makes him utterly different. Which is the meaning, part of the meaning of the word holiness. It may be the first primary meaning of the word holiness, of holy. God is holy. That is the most root sense of the word. And in the most root sense of the word, 
It means to be cut. It means to be set apart. He is completely other. He, there is none like him. You know, we could say that he's something else. You know, while there's never a perfect way, a perfect analogy to describe God, or even God's attributes or his uh, character, while there's never a perfect analogy, a helpful way to think about God uh, is, and, and his holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. You know, the sun is unique, right? Within our solar system anyway. It's pretty unique. And uh, it's really powerful. And it's the source of all life, all, you know, here on earth. If we didn't have the sun, we would have no life. And you could say that the sun in that way is unique. It's different. It's really something else. It's holy in that sense. And you could take this metaphor even further in saying that uh, the whole area around the sun, okay, within the proximity of the sun, is also holy. Because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yes? So that, uh, so that the very power and goodness that generates life uh, from this sun Right? The closer you get to it, the more dangerous it gets. So it's pretty dangerous also. I mean, the sun, if you get close enough to it, what will it do? It'll annihilate you. And most other things. And in the same way, that's a paradox at the heart of God's own holiness. Because if you're impure, if you're unclean, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad. Not because his presence is bad, but because his presence is so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness is in the story of Moses in the burning bush. It's when, uh, where God tells Moses to take off his sandals because, it's, uh, because he's standing on holy ground. It's the first time the actual word uh, holy as such, is used in, uh, in the Bible. He tells Moses to take off his, uh, his uh, sandals when he's, uh, during the incident of the uh, burning bush. And Moses then, what does he do? He covers his face. And uh, God says to Moses, do not come any closer. Do not come any closer. It's just way too intense for Moses. It's just too intense for Moses. If he approached closer, it would annihilate him. And actually, that intensity is explored even further and even more in the uh, following stories that continue, in the stories about Israel's temple, right? which was the main place where God's holy presence was especially located. And at the center of the temple was this room. It was called the most holy place, the holy of holies. It was the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you were an Israelite living uh, in and around the land of that temple, or if you're a priest, an actual priest working inside the temple, you would be considered in close proximity to God. You're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. So this poses a problem. How is, how, how is that supposed to work? In the Bible, it gives us a solution. It tells us, it gives us a solution, is that uh, you need to become pure. That you need to be pure. Now, this includes being morally pure, but the Bible also talks about another kind of purity, and that's being ritually pure. And that's a state in which you separate yourself from anything uh, related to death, like touching things like dead skin or dead bodies or even certain body fluids. These could make you unclean or impure. Um, but there's an important thing to remember here. Becoming ritually impure <coughs> wasn't the actual sin. It's not the actual sin in self, itself. What's wrong with it? What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in the impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure and steps for becoming pure so that they were then able to go into the temple again. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. But it doesn't stop there. The idea keeps developing. And if we fast forward 600-ish years or so, 
later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story about a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision with, uh, where he's in this temple, and he's in God's presence in this temple, in the temple. And he's totally terrified, and then this crazy creature called a seraphim is flying around. It flies around, and it takes a hot coal, and it sears Isaiah's lips. And with the coal, and it says something really weird. It says, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. It's remarkable because uh, normally, if you touch something, what happens is that that impurity, uh, it transfers its impurity to you. But now, here's this new idea where you have this coal. The very holy and pure object, and it touches uh, Isaiah's lips and it transfers its purity to him. And Isaiah is not destroyed by God's uh, holiness. In fact, he's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of that are just huge. But there's one more development. Th development. This time with another prophet called Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling down of it. And uh, that water then turns into a stream, and from the stream it turns into a deep river, and then from it, as it's uh, turning into this deep river, it starts flowing through the desert, and it leaves all this big trail of trees and, uh, behind it, trees and life behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first, and then going into the temple, here we see in this vision God's holiness coming out from the temple and making things pure and bringing them to life. What does that all mean? Where are, what are all the implications of this? And you know, we don't know. And we don't know until further, until we read further and the Bible doesn't tell us, until we get into the New Testament. And that's where we meet this man. We meet a man named Jesus. And he claims that he is fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in a surprising new way. So Jesus goes around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a woman with chronic bleeding, dead people. And when he touches their impurity, what should, ha what should happen normally, it should transfer over to Jesus, that impurity. But instead, what happens? Jesus' purity transfers to them. And actually, he heals so many people, as we read of in the New Testament. He heals their bodies. And do we see a parallel here to Isaiah's vision? And we do see a parallel here. Jesus is like that holy coal that uh, touched Isaiah's lips. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness. And what's more, now he and those that chose to follow him were God's temple. And through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world. And it would bring life. And it would bring hope. And it would bring healing. And this is why Jesus described his followers as streams of living water. Streams of living water full, uh, flowing out of them. And that brings it to us. It brings it to you if you're a follower of Jesus. That, that's our part of the story. And that's where we find ourselves today. But where is all this heading? Well, the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. This time by a guy named John in the book of Revelation. And in his vision, we see the whole world is made completely new. It's transformed, regenerated. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. And so God's holiness permeates throughout all of his created order, which includes making us spotless, making us perfect, and making us without stain, so that we can stand in close relationships, so that we can be in proximity of the Almighty Creator without being annihilated so that we can be with the Holy One. You could say we're transformed into something else. 
If there is one thing I want you guys to get uh, out of this message today, the one takeaway I want you guys to take is this little statement. I was made in his image to act in his image. This is the purpose of holiness as applied to you and me as to people. I was made in his image to act in his image. In a nutshell, that's my whole sermon. But I want to focus and concentrate on three specific questions that will help us to better grasp a little bit more about holiness. First, I want to look at what is it? Secondly, I will look at why it's important. And thirdly, I want to take a look at uh, what are we supposed to do about it? What shall I do about it? So let's uh, look at the first one. What is it? What is holiness? Holiness is one of those uh, biblical religious words, I'm sure you guys have heard. You know that uh, nobody uses it except for religious people or church going people that much. Or maybe uh, they use it about religious people or uh, most often in a negative context or for sometimes uh, pre, uh, in, in before an explicit term, right? That's how non-church people use it. You know, uh, and they use it to make fun of holy people, as in, uh, he thinks uh, he's holier than thou. Now, he's uh, such a holy roller, or something to that effect. It's a way of uh, making fun of religious people. But the biblical concept itself is completely different. Uh, it's, it's completely foreign to us. And unfortunately, I think for the uh, most religious people, it sort of even gets lost, uh, and it gets reduced down, as I mentioned earlier, to moral goodness. While moral goodness is a piece of it, uh, it's so much more than that. It's a, it's, a, it's a big, rich, huge idea that projects, as I mentioned, all the way through the Bible. And I sort of took you through uh, a little journey from the beginning to the end in a minute, uh, as quick as I could. And we can only understand it if we get the whole big idea and, uh, around it. It's not just a piece. The portrait of holiness created for most of us, at least for those that are us that are under 50, maybe it was a little bit different before then, has been a way to act in church. And so you know, it's a, holiness means this is the way I should act in church. Or maybe it's a list of do's and don'ts to live by outside of the church. You know, we were taught holiness is something we become by not dancing or not drinking or not having sex or not watching R-rated movies or whatever it might be. If we could just avoid these evil things, then we could be holy. Then we could be holy. Right, right or wrong, it seems now that uh, even that, many have just simply abandoned the idea of holiness altogether. Right? But even the dictionary, even the Merriam-Webster dictionary, understands the fundamental reality of holiness as being a positive pursuit of someone rather than uh, abstaining from certain behaviors. The dictionary defines it as this. It defines holy as exalted or worthy of complete devotion. Or as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Or also as having a divine quality. These de de definitions of holy paint a picture that many Christians, that many of us sometimes fail to understand. Holiness is something of God. It's not something of us, not something we gain through the way we live. We must grasp holiness, not as a new behavior. Holiness is not a new behavior. It's not a new action. It's not a new discipline. This is not holiness. Rather, holiness is new affections. Holiness is new desires. Holiness is new motives, which then can lead to new behavior. Now, holiness is not found in strict, just rule-keeping alone. It is found uh, only and primarily in our desire for the Holy One. You know, in his classic work, The Holiness of God, R.C. Sproul says this, We must seek to understand what the Holy is. We dare not seek to avoid it. There could be no worship, no spiritual growth, no true obedience without it. It defines our goal as Christians. 
And that's quite a claim. Our entire goal as Christians is wrapped up in and it revolves around holiness, is what Mr. Sproul is saying here. It defines our goal as Christians. That's a statement that should cause pause for reflection in us. Holiness, first and foremost, is an attribute of God. We cannot go any further without understanding this. Holiness originates from God. Uh, God is the only source of holiness. In 1 Samuel, in the book of 1 Samuel, um, chapter 2, verse 2, tells us this. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no law, rock like our God. But holiness is not just an attribute of God. Of all his attributes, it is the most fundamental. And holiness transcends all other attributes. All of other God's attributes, holiness transcends all of them. That is to say, holiness carries through and is present in any of the other attributes that belong to God. Now, God is love. God is omniscience. God is wrath. We know, you know, we may know some of these attributes. But holiness, God's love is holy. God's omniscience is holy. God's wrath even is holy. It transcends all his attributes. The Puritan clergyman, Stephen Sharnock, says this about holiness. Power is God's hand or arm. Omniscience, his eye. Mercy is his bowels, eternity his duration, but holiness, holiness is his beauty. And holiness is God's attributes of attributes. It's his beauty. Holiness is not ascribed to God. It's not given to God. It is altogether self-originating within his identity. God is holy. And therefore his Holiness, his characteristics uh, are in uh, it, holiness is in all of his character, in all of his ways. In all that he does, he is holy. And he can no more not be holy than he can no more not be God. The idea of holy, as its core, uh, at, at the core, as I sort of mentioned before, means to be distinct or set apart, utterly unique. In fact, the word in the Hebrew for holy is kadosh. And it's related to the word uh, meaning to cut. And as in to cut, to separate, to set apart, to be wholly other, to be totally distinct, to be totally something else. Holiness can refer to all kinds of things in the Bible, and not only God. It can also at times refer to things like days of the calendar, right, can be holy. A room can be holy. A space can be, a certain space can be holy. Certain kinds of people, certain types of objects. A fork can be holy. All of these are set aside as kadosh, as holy. Set apart for a unique purpose of God. But why is something holy? Something is holy in the Bible always because it is in close relationship to God. So anything that's holy, its holiness is derivative from God. It's set apart because it's connected closely to God, who is the ultimate, unique, holy, set apart one. One, that only the one type of being that is that. There's none like him. You know, in Isaiah 6, we uh, read about the mighty creatures, the seraphim that I mentioned. They continually fly around him with feet and their uh, face covered, proclaiming that he is holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. The earth is full of his glory. You know, when Isaiah sees that in his vision, seeing this, all he can do is say this, Woe, woe is me, for I am lost. The grandeur and glory of God, his holiness, it was so great that none can pass by him without severe consequences, without great consequences. Can you imagine being in the proximity of such majesty? I mean, this is the Holy One that spoke planets 
that spoke stars and light itself into being. It's hard for us to imagine uh, how vast our universe is. We don't even know completely, in fact. And it's this Holy One that created all of that. You know, my family, uh, my family and I recently took a trip to NASA. I love going there because I'm, uh, because I'm sort of a space buff. But just thinking about and seeing all that uh, that's out there, it just puts me in awe of God. You know, Cap NASA keeps giving us more and more information about our universe. And in some, uh, and, and it seems that with each report, it gets to be even more and more wonderful. It's been theorized that the universe is over 90 billion light years wide. 90 billion light years wide. With at least 100 billion Earth-like planets in that universe. 100 billion. Those numbers are so great, they're so high, they're so big that they end up meaning not too much to us. I mean, I know, I know you know, I know the distance, I know the uh, math, I know the distance of a light year, right? You know how big that number is. It's 5 trillion, 878 billion, 499 million, 810 thousand miles. I didn't memorize it, it's in my notes. But that's huge. But we can't even, it, we can't even get to uh, wrap that around our minds. Let's just know that my mind is uh, too small to comprehend that number. 100 billion planets like Earth. Just his creation, it staggers us. How much greater is this creator? We worship a great, big, powerful God. God of complete grandeur. God of complete beauty and a God of complete majesty. And this, it is this kadosh of God, uh, God, this holiness of God that describes the majesty of God. So what is it? What is holiness? Holiness is the majesty of God and the purity and moral perfection of his nature. Next, why is it important? Why is that important? Why is holiness important? The short answer is this, because God said so. In Leviticus 20, verse 26, it makes this perfectly clear. We read it earlier. Let me read it again. It says, You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. It's pretty clear. God commanded it. Well, you might say, well, that was the Old Testament. Okay, well, let's go to the New Testament. We read that also. 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be con uh, conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Here Peter reaffirms the same command, as, uh, command from God given in Leviticus. So why is uh, holiness important? Because God says so. He commands it. How am I to have moral perfection and purity? How are we as people to have moral perfection and purity? Well, the answer is in the Leviticus passage itself. You are to be holy, not in the aspect of moral perfection, but what does the passage says, says, uh, say? It says, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. You are to be holy. You are to be separated, set apart, reserved for the Lord, set apart, in such a way uh, that you will be his. You know, while this may not uh, mean moral perfection in your lifestyle while you're still living on here, it does imply conduct that's befitting of that which belongs to God. You know, you belong to God. You are to remain pure. You are to not defile yourself with ongoing lifestyles of sin. We are to be set apart to belong to the Lord. We are to reflect his image, therefore, in an appropriate manner as belonging to God. Your conduct as such ought to reflect that image accordingly. I remember I mentioned the one big idea I want you guys to take away from today's message is what? I was made in his image to act as an image. 
I was made in his image to act in his image. And in here is our calling to holiness. Be holy, for I am holy. Our calling is important, and so holiness is important. It's important because God said so. You know, for many years, when I was growing up, uh, I always found that answer, uh, because I said so, to be an unsatisfactory answer. You know, that is, until I became a dad myself and started using the same answer myself, because I said so. Okay. What a great dad answer, especially for uh, us here on Father's Day today. But you know what? Our Heavenly Father is a bit more gracious. Uh, he's a bit more gracious than us human fathers. God doesn't really give the answer because I said so and leave it at that. He tells us why. He actually stoops down to give us a reason if we have the audacity to ask why. God says, you are to be holy to me because, listen, because I, the Lord, am holy. He actually gives us a reason, but he doesn't stop there. He gives us another one. And I have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. But why is it important? It's important because he commanded it. And that, uh, the one who commanded, that commanding he, is that he who created you. The planet you're on, the stars above, and everything else in the universe. That he whose spoken word created billions and billions of light years wide worth of space and matter. It's that he whose majesty is incomprehensible. It's unfathomable. It's that he who is the Holy One. The Holy, Holy, Holy. The Kadosh, 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 the Thrice Holy One. It is that he who commanded it. That is why holiness is important. Finally, what are we supposed to do about it? What are we supposed to do in response to knowing that God is utterly and completely holy? And how do we respond after knowing why that holiness is important? What are we supposed to do about that? Well, let's start here. Let's remind ourselves one more time but my core idea today. I was made in his image to act in his image. This idea has a primary imperative in it that tells us about our functional role in holiness. But to know where you are, you need, uh, you need to know where you are before you know where you're going to go. And in order to get to a destination, you have to know your current location. Right? You've got to know where you're at before you know where you're going. Now let's imagine someone blindfolds you and uh, lands a helicopter on top of the roof of the loft here and shoves you into the helicopter, okay? and flies you around for several hours. And then they throw you off the helicopter with a parachute. Okay? And now you're given the task to get back to Richardson, Texas, to get back to Loft. Okay? How would you do it? Right? You have no idea whether Loft is north, south, east, or west of you. Right? Because you have no idea where you are. But you might say, well, I can wait till the sun rises and know where it falls and you know all that stuff. I can follow the stars and so forth to know. No, no, that wouldn't work either. Because you have no idea where you are in relation to where a loft is. You don't know if, uh, what good would it do you, uh, for you to know where north, south, east, and west is if you don't know where loft is uh, in relation to where you're at because you don't know if it's north, south, east, or west of you. At the very least, it would be very difficult, right? Until, until you find that out. Until you know where you are, where you're at. Once you know where you are, you can then start heading in the right direction. You've got to know where you're at before you know where you're going to go. In terms of holiness, you've also got to know where you're at before knowing where to go. Our functional, external holiness can't begin with us. Right? We know that only God is holy. Right? God is the only one that is utterly holy. And only from him, through him and by him, 
can we get anything that resembles holiness? We have to understand that our starting point is a place of complete deprivation. Right? We have to know that our starting place is, of holiness is nowhere. We can't get to holy without knowing where we are. And where we are is at a position of complete holiness deprivation. And so a deposit of holiness needs to come from somewhere. It must be given to us through God's grace and by faith alone. And that's what Ephesians 2.8 tells us. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And that comes when that hole, that happens when that coal, that coal, that hot coal, that is Jesus Christ, touches your lips. And Isaiah, as Isaiah was made pure through the transference of holiness to approach God, with Jesus, we are made pure, cleansed of any sort of stain or blemish in our lives, past, present, or future. The holiness of God himself the holiness of the Son is transferred to us, and we are no, then not only capable of approaching God's presence, we are adopted into his family, and we become his sons and daughters. 1 John 1.9, he claims this, and he claims just that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And now that idea made in his image, to act in his image, becomes more attainable. Holiness transfers to us as we have the power through God's Holy Spirit uh, to abide to his commandments and to his will. We get that transfer of holiness from God once we accept his son. Does this mean that we will never sin again? No. But it does mean that when we do sin, it will sting us. And we will not continue to uh, sin in, or have a lifestyle of that sin. The Holy Spirit will reside in us to practice holiness, to satisfy us more and more unto holiness, to sanctify us more unto holiness. Remember, holiness means to be set apart, separated. And um, with the holiness of Christ transferred to us, we too can become set apart and separated. We too can become dedicated unto the purpose of God. We too will continuously become uh, uh, strive towards holiness, being sanctified. You know, the way they used to refine silver and gold is they would heat up that silver and gold, or silver, let's just use that as an example. They would heat the silver to such a high temperature that all the impurities, all the junk, all the gunk would rise to the top. Then the uh, refiner would take that top portion, that top layer, and discard that away. And he would do this several times and keep doing it over and over till he, an image of him, the refiner, an image would appear of uh, him in the molten silver. And eventually, as he kept doing that, he would refine it, heat it, heat it. All the impurities would rise, and uh, they would take off the impurities from the top, and the image becomes clearer and clearer of his face in the silver. This is what God does with us. He is like that refiner. He sometimes turns up the heat in our lives to bring out the impurities, turns up the heat to bring out all the gunk and the junk in our lives, and he takes that top layer, removes it, discards it, and he sees his image becoming more and more like him. So in that sense, God is a refiner. He's a refiner of us. He's a refiner of his children. <clears throat> As we become holy, we become, you know, closer and closer. We're able to approach, become, uh, come closer to the proximity of God. We become holy. We become something else. Does holiness mean that we lose our individuality, and now as some type of robot we're programmed into a lifestyle, right? And, and we lose our individual expression of freedom to just uh, be there to follow a bunch of rules and tell us do's and don'ts? No. Contrary to that, 
It's just the opposite. Not only are we made fully free, and uh, only now can we start experiencing the, experiencing the full humanity as God called us to be. Only now can we become what we were made to be. Only now can we experience made in his image to act in his image. Now, we're not robots. But, you know, sometimes it's helpful to actually consider, uh, and it's easier to describe something that's difficult, difficult to uh, grasp by exploring what it's not. Holiness is not an imperative that turns us into automated robots unto God. Right? Have you all heard of Stepford Wives? Right? You might have heard that story or the movie. It was a book originally written in 1975. It was a movie and then there was a later movie. But Stepford Wives is an interesting story. It's about a group of men um, in Stepford, Connecticut that murder their wives. And they replace them with robotic replicas that obey their every whim and desire. But these robots, these robot wives, they don't have all the beautiful, chaotic, messy characteristics that their real flesh and blood women have. Right? They, they don't have, uh, you know, they listen to them, they uh, please them in certain ways, and they uh, obey their every desire and their whim, but they don't have that love they don't have uh, the uniqueness that made their human wives what they were. And in short, that's Stepford Wives. And sometimes we think about holiness, and we think that holiness, that God is looking for, he's looking for Stepford Christians. Sometimes we think that, or at least we act that way. We think that God is looking for Stepford Christians. You know, we have to say a certain thing. We have to wear a certain thing. We have to listen to a certain type of music. Because what God wants more than anything else is robotic like Christians, right? That's what we make it out to be. You know, step for Christians that say the right things, that don't do the wrong things. There's just real no flavor or fire or love or passion or will. And I've got to tell you through, it's just not true. Holiness is not a divine God attempt at creating versions of Stepford wives. God's not looking for Stepford Christians. Holiness is not a call to robotic rule keeping. Holiness is really about your heart, not your actions. So even though there may be things that a Christian ought to do and not do, the main point beneath all of that is your heart. God wants your heart, all of it. God even said the greatest commandment, quoting from Deuteronomy 6, 5, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And that's from the Old Testament. That's before Leviticus and all those laws. So even in the law, God was always after your heart. The point is, it's not about rule keeping. Holiness involves the heart. If God has your heart, then actions, your actions are of little problem. But if he doesn't have your heart, even your actions are a little, uh, of little value. God wants your heart. It's the bottom line. But it's not that alone. He also wants uh, you to want his heart. Okay? Sometimes we think it's about a list. It's about putting God first. Right? Uh, it, we have an unofficial motto in this country, especially in Texas. God, family, country. For many years, I, you know, I don't know how many uh, Americans actually follow that, to that order, God, family, country. But for many years, I thought that was right, right? Put God first, put family first, put uh, country next. And, you know, it's a good list, a good priority list. But over the years, I've come to realize it's pretty flawed. It's not about God being first. You cannot put God, remember, he is something else. You can't put him in the same list of, as, as everything else. It's not about God being first. It's about God transcending everything. It's about, being, about God being over everything. It's about God being over all your priorities. It's not a question of God being the priority. God is above all your priorities. So God is not first on a list. God transcends everything. If your family is first on the list, 
then God shines through your family. God shines in you to your family. If your country is on your list, then you reflect God in your view of your country. So God transcends everything on your list. God should reflect everything on your list. And so God wants our heart. He wants our heart first. Transformation, that's what he's after. If you've accepted Christ, you will have transformation. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 tells us. I won't read the whole thing. But it tells us uh, that that is what God's after. But there's also some warnings. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us this. For people that do not strive after holiness, strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will uh, see the Lord. Don't let your life pass without experiencing that transformation, the true freedom found in Christ. So today, we've covered what is holiness, why is it important, and what do I do about it? Hopefully we've learned a little bit about holiness from what God's word teaches us. If nothing else, I hope you understand what it means to be made in his image, to act in his image. God is holy, holy, holy. And if you're set apart for this purpose, for his purpose, you are holy. You're something else. I'll end with the words of uh, 1 Peter 16. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Let me pray for us. O oh God of the universe, our gracious Heavenly Father, these are weighty things and are easily misheard and easily misunderstood and misinterpreted. I pray that you counter that and that you uh, guard against that and that you continue to preach your holiness to our conscience and to continue your ongoing sanctifying work in all our hearts. Would you give us a glimpse of your own holiness and that, that we see its splendor and its beauty, and that we pursue it, and that we strive after it because we are your children and we want so much to be holy as you are. It is our great delight, our great prayer, the great work that we have here on earth to pursue holiness. We pray for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.